So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this IIS uh, Quantitative Finance and FinTech mini workshop. Uh, today we are very happy to have uh, Henry Tai from uh, IIS, the director of IIS, to be here to give a few opening remarks. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, welcome you all, and uh, this is the uh, sort of a new or inaugural uh, IES uh, Quantity Finance and uh, Financial Technology Seminar Series, and uh, happy to have uh, Xinhua, Ning, and Yingying uh, to help organize this. And uh, the goal is to bring faculty, students, researchers who work in quantity finance, but now is spread in different departments, different schools, in fact, uh, School of Business, of course, and uh, School of Engineering and School of Science uh, to come together so that I uh, hope that you have some interactions. And that's the main goal that we have. And uh, I hope that uh, the seminar series will involve talks, which is understandable for all three parties, and uh, hope that uh, this will encourage them to have more interactions. And uh, the other goal is that uh, uh, not only have to be outside speakers, but uh, maybe even internal, they can uh, talk to each other. And uh, from IS point of view, uh, if you do that, we'll provide refreshments. <laughs> so, uh, so we hope this uh, series be a very successful one, and I'm happy that the first one uh, that already expand to a mini workshop. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I thank you for supporting this, and I hope more of the faculty in these uh, areas, and students and postdocs and researchers will uh, participate uh, over time as we go along. So even though we start in summer. So I thank the committee members uh, for this uh, very valuable effort. So, thank you. It is my great honor to introduce our first plenary speaker, Professor George Tauchen from uh, Duke, Duke University. Um, Professor Tauchen is currently the WH um, Glasson Professor of Economics and Finance at Duke. And uh, Professor Tauchen is um, a fellow of the Econometric Society, a fellow of the American Statistical Association, and fellow of the Journal of Economet uh, Econometrics, and fellow for the Society of Financial Econ Metrics. And Professor Tauchin uh, is a former uh, editor of the Journal of Business and Economic Statistics, JBES, and former associate editor of Econometrica, um, uh, Econometric Theory, the um, Journal of American Statistical Association, and also the uh, Journal of Business Economic Statistics. And today, Professor Tauchin is going to tell us about rank tests at jump events. Welcome. Well, Ying Ying, thank you for that uh, good, wonderful introduction. And it's really an honor to be invited here and to give uh, a, a plenary talk, and especially uh, uh, among, among the, those at the, um, at the first version of this. And I was thinking when the uh, official was, was talking about, uh, about this, I, I would also encourage you to invite uh, uh, submissions from uh, colleagues at the other universities. There are a great many universities in the Hong Kong area. It's just like the area that I'm in, where there are three world-class universities. And we actually have a conference where we have outsiders and, and, and people from the other universities as well. So it's just a tiny suggestion uh, as to how to uh, uh, broaden, it, uh, broaden it out. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today uh, falls into the category in the list of topics of statistical methods uh, for uh, financial um, uh, research, and it's uh, in particular, it's I'm, I'm, you'll learn what exactly uh, I mean by this title here. Uh, uh, rank test at jump at jump events, and my co-authors are Jia Li. Jia Li is a uh, He's from mainland China. He went to study at Princeton, and he's now 
uh, a, fa a star young faculty member at uh, Duke University. And uh, Victor uh, got his PhD at Duke, and now he's, uh, he's been very successful, and he's a uh, full professor at Northwestern. And Huidi Lin is a graduate student who is starting her PhD at the School of Business, Kellogg School of Business at Northwestern. And she did a master's at Duke, and I'll tell you, she is incredibly smart. So she is going to be giving these plenary talks in, uh, five, in, in, in 10, 15 years, uh, believe me. So let me tell you what, uh, uh, what this is about. Uh, so uh, this is kind of a stock outline. Uh, I'm going to first start with this panel. What's really kind of new in the paper is this panel data framework. Uh, and then, of course, we have to have mo uh, models for it. And then the method, what we're actually going to, you know, how do you actually do what we're talking about doing? And it's really simple. Uh, it's just a, a combination of, of some simple MATLAB scripts. The theory, the statistical theory is hard. But we did the statistical theory in order to make what the user does on the data reasonably simple to do and simple and easy to do. And that's sort of the job of the uh, statistician or the econometrician. And so if I could just start with our, uh, I got to point it here. Why is it not going? Ah, OK. Let me um, uh, first talk about the, uh, the what, I, what I want to see is the main takeaway messages. And the first is that uh, jumps, which I'm going to be talking about a lot, and I hope you get to understand, jumps are a real characteristic of financial time series. And then you have to ask yourself, what is a jump? Well, a jump is intrinsically a continuous time concept. It, it doesn't have any meaning in, uh, in, in discrete time data. I mean, discrete time data can have heavy tails, but who knows where the heavy tails came from. A jump is a pathwise discontinuity in the uh, path of the, of, of, the, of the financial price. Now, uh, what is it, what's a more practical definition? It's a movement in an asset price that's too large to have been plausibly accounted for by a model with continuous sample paths. Financial economics abounds with uh, diffusive models, purely diffusive models, in which the uh, trajectories that come out are, are pathwise continuous. And data don't act that way. Data have, got, um, data have got moves that are too sharp, too large, over short periods of time that, that, that no, no plausible model with continuous sample paths could, could have accounted for it. And so uh, that's why we use uh, jumps. And jumps now can be uh, detected uh, actually at a super fast rate. You'll see how it works. And measured with a precision that's proportional to the uh, width of the sampling interval. Uh, and with a manageable asymptotic distribution, that's very easy, uh, very, very easy to simulate. And I was thinking uh, during the David's talk a, a couple days ago, he was talking about the microscope and the uh, probability models for uh, the, the colloidals. I, the colloid I don't know all the words. I'm not a physicist. But the, uh, the models in suspension, uh, the particles in suspension, the statistical models that, that were developed for that. And um, the, the, this was with a microscope. Jumps have been a characteristic of financial data for hundreds and hundreds of years. However, now we have the microscope. Now we have availability of the very high frequency data. And that provides us with the microscope that we need. And so what I'm going to do is talk about statistical methods for handling data uh, when we have something like a microscope. All right? Um, So jumps, uh, they're actually a character. I'll give you an empirical example in just a second. And they can uh, be uh, observed and measured. Now, uh, the, this is kind of what the paper is really about, is that the covariance matrix of a collection of equity returns, here we use the Dow 30, but we have in mind other larger collections, such as the S&P 100 or the S&P 500. That work is uh, ongoing. 
and uh, is, is not done yet. Here we're going to use the Dow 30. Uh, and uh, it's going to talk about the way that the rank of the returns matrix, the variance matrix, collapses to a rank one matrix. That's going to be kind of the main empirical finding. Uh, and also the rank of the covariance matrix of other aggregate returns, other assets like bonds and foreign currency, it doesn't collapse in that manner. It does not collapse. That's kind of the main empirical message of uh, paper. Okay. Ah, let me give you some examples. So this is one minute data. Uh, these are one minute data on, um, on some selected dates. This is really, I think this date was September 18th, 2013. And the black is the market recorded at one minute intervals. And the red is a stock. Here the stock is ticker symbol BA, which is Boeing. It, ma it makes the big airplanes. And notice how that the market is just sort of moving along kind of like diffusively with, with a path here that could be described by diffusive model. Then over this one minute period, it takes this leap. And then it goes back to diffusing again. And sampling it at one minute intervals like that, well, it looks exactly like a jump. And this is why we use jump models and talk about the statistical properties. Now, one might be tempted to drill down to the ultra finest level, such as uh, not, 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 not one minute, but instead drill down to one second. What's going to happen is if you do that, that jump, it's going to, what's going to happen is that you're, there's going to be a lot of noise in your measurements uh, due, due to the trading frictions, the bid ass bounce, the order book, and all this kind of stuff. And that jump really is going to be smeared out over 15, 20 seconds. And so the analogy with physics is perfect. If you stand back a little bit and, and look at things, you can use the standard uh, differential equations to describe uh, a, a system. If you drill down to the uh, atomic level or the quantum level, you get there all the, I mean, all the, the graininess matters, and, and you see and then the world looks completely different. All right? And so I'm not going to do that. In this paper, we're not going to drill down to that level. We're going to talk about some of the effects of what happens um, because of these trading frictions, drilling down to that level is a very interesting thing to do. And that's what uh, Ying Ying and Zing Wang have done a number of very important papers about the trading friction noises, the property of the, of the trading frictions, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, and, uh, and it's very, very important. It's economically very important. But from the perspective of this line of work, it isn't. So I'm not going to drill down. And we're going to step back just a little bit. And when we step back just a little bit, we see that sort of a kind of a, a, a diffusive, a continuous sample path model doesn't describe that data set, that, 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 that trajectory very well. And black is the market, and uh, red is the stock. And notice how Boeing moved almost uh, in sympathy with the stock market. All right, uh, here's another event. Uh, this is August 5th, 2014. I'll tell you what the events are in just a second. Uh, August 2014, uh, this is AXP, that's American Express. The market, uh, the market again took one of these uh, uh, jumps. It, it, took, it took a down jump, and then American Express actually even took a little bit of a larger jump. And then they sort of go on acting like uh, the realizations of a diffusive process. Here is, uh, I kind of like this one. This is October 1st. This is in the middle of the financial crisis. In the middle of the financial crisis, actually, at 13.45, the market jumped up. It jumped up. Uh, and the jump is defined, I'll tell you how they're defined. They're defined relative to the local volatility. So there are these sharp moves relative to the local volatility. And actually, there was, a, there was an up jump for almost comical reasons. Uh, and uh, CVX, I think that makes, uh, I think that's a, a, a I forget what I forget what CVX is. You see that it kind of moved in sympathy with the market as well. Now over here we have a 10:01 in the morning jump. That actually there was some mac there was some aggregate news that was announced, and I'll explain it. And we see that the market opens at 9:30, ticks along, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, like a like continuous process. Bam, down it went from 10 to 10:01. It took this drop of almost 50 basis points, and then it goes on diffusing along with it. Now. 
The red is Walmart. Probably everybody hears the word of Walmart, the big retailer, uh, big, cheap, low-cost retailer. Look at what Walmart did. Walmart moved down, but its down move kind of got smeared over a couple of periods. Okay, it's, it's, it's downward jump got smeared over a couple of periods. And that smearing is something we're going to have to take into account later. That's, they're, called, they're called gradual jumps. And they occur because of uh, trading frictions like what's going on with the order books, what's going on on the trading floors or with the, you know, with the traders and, uh, and these various frictions, which we really don't want to model here. I'm not interested in modeling them. We're interested in some other things here. Uh, so uh, you can see how there can be uh, somewhat of a gradual dump in response to a market jump. And that actually becomes important, and we have to take that into account uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the statistics uh, later on. All right, so these are four of us. I, I, we, got, we, got, we got thousands of pictures like this. So we got 30 Dow, 30 Dow stocks and uh, a, a batch of market jumps, and we got files with thousands of pictures, and they all kind of look like this. Um, what happened on those dates? Well, the first one is kind of easy. On September 18th, 2013, the Fed surprised the markets by not tapering quantitative easing. Everyone thought that the Fed was going to implement quantitative easing. The Fed announces, no, we're not going to implement uh, quantitative easing, and then the, the, mar the markets took off. Uh, August 5th, well, this is not unusual, Greek bailout talks. I mean, there are Greek bailout talks all the time, all right? And then uh, so there was some kind of announcement about Greek bailout talks. No surprise there. The one in October, this is in the middle of the financial crisis, okay? Uh, diffusive volatility is huge. The markets are gyrating all over the place, but then there is this up jump in the middle of the financial crisis because the Senate voted on a modified version of the uh, $700 billion bailout package that the House rejected, and this is more about. Also, the newspaper said that views of Sarah Palin, remember good old Sarah Palin? She ran with uh, McCain, was kind of a, uh, almost a comical uh, uh, politician, um, uh, remain in flux, and the changing views of Palin are becoming more negative than positive. And according to the newspapers, that, that played a role in that jump. Who knows? Some of these jumps you can associate, some of them you can go back and you can go back and find what kind of what happened, what actually caused that. Other times you look at the you look at the newspaper that day and you get this almost anthropomorphic description. It said, you know, the market got out of bed uh, late this morning and about 11.30 realized it needed to get stock prices in line and so they all moved up or they all moved on. I mean, you hear, these, you hear them on the, on the, on the radio at the, at the end of the day, these uh, explanations for these large moves. Some of them just come in because of various global events uh, that, are, that are taking place and so, uh, uh, yeah, some can be associated with announcements, others cannot. Uh, it's like Zeus is kind of up there throwing uh, lightning bolts down at us. It's a really interesting property, I think. And then the last one, uh, well, that was at, that was at 10 one in the morning. Stocks tumbled uh, because a key measure of consumer confidence plunged, and then that, that, that caused the, the stock to tumble. And they, so it's these discrete moves. No plausible, continuous, diffusive path model could describe those discrete observations that I showed you. It would have to have very crazy properties to be able to do that. And so it's much easier to model them as jump diffusion. We're going to have another talk today uh, about jump diffusions as well. So let me show you how the moves in the market and the moves in the individual stocks line up at jump times. What you're looking at here is a scatter plot of the return on the uh, sector ETF that mimics the financial sector. And, and I, this, is, this was the detected market jump. And then this is, the, this is just whatever, whatever that sector did. And they're almost collinear. They're almost collinear. And I promise, I promise, we first made the plots 
were astounded at how collinear things were. And then, and then we went and developed the theory. That is actually how it happened. We were expecting, oh God, let's plot this against that. We're going to get junk. If you get junk, you got to report it. Uh, but then they, they lined up almost along a straight line. And, that, and I'll tell you why the finance theory and the statistical theory uh, we've shown in a, in, a, in, a, in a batch of papers actually in the end predicts that, 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 that things will uh, line up this way. Uh, we found that to be uh, somewhat uh, astounding. Okay, this is in 2008. Uh, if you take all of the jumps, all of the market jumps, these are actually 10 minute data. These are from an old, old paper. Uh, if you take all of the, the jumps over 2007, 2012 in the market and you plot the returns on that same, on that same ETF against the market move jump, well, it's not quite so collinear anymore. And if you look at this, you think, well, I might want to do uh, robust uh, regression instead of ordinary least squares. And we actually have a paper uh, coming out in, uh, in uh, JASA and Statistics Journal uh, that deals with uh, ro uh, robustly estimating uh, these uh, jump regressions. So, to what? The, um, uh, in, in, in a series of previous papers, we investigated these pairwise relationships between the individual stocks and the, and, and, and the measured stock market. Here, in this paper, I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. I'm going to, uh, instead of looking at things pairwise, uh, I'm going to use a cross section. I'm going to use a cross section of returns, none of which is the market itself. They're actually the returns on the Dow, each, each of the Dow 30 stocks. So it's going to be a panel of 30 stocks at, 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 at the one minute level. And, uh, we're gonna, and we're going to think about whatever's going on in the background is latent, is unobserved. And, and whatever happens, happens. Although the, uh, the previous jump regressions lead one to expect that maybe we're going to get a lower dimensional structure of the jump times. Possibly. And that's what this paper is about. So I want you to consider a very large panel of high frequency returns in our data set. Uh, N is there are 390 one minute returns per day. We had 2,000, 2,223 days, and there are 30 Dow well, stocks. This is our so, first lap. so if you are set down right now, each group, each group. One What's leaking in? Taking your student ID card. Oh, it sounds very interesting. <laughs> Some, something's bleeding in. Okay, so in total, we have 866,000, almost 867,000 observations, data points on the Dow 30 stocks 2007 2015. It's a huge panel. And let's think about what that panel looks like. Well, I, I, uh, normally in panel data, uh, we think of it as a rectangular matrix with time going down this axis and the other, whatever you're measuring, going across. So you got this long, thin matrix for uh, the just made the math of this paper a little bit simple is to take the transpose, to look at the transpose of that matrix. So what, uh, what goes across the top is time, and what goes across uh, the rows is stocks. And so this is the return on the first stock in the first minute on the first day till the, return, till, till the, first, till the last, last observation in the last day of the data set. This is the second stock, so forth. So it's got 30 rows and 867,000 uh, columns, or if you think of it in the ordinary way, it would have 867,000 rows and, and, and 30 columns. Okay. Naturally, whenever you get a great big panel like that, it's natural to ask, well, what is the you know kind of what is the factor? Are, are there you got 30 stocks? Are there just a few factors that are driving them? Are there just a few factors that are driving them? And we know from finance theory, like Fama French three-factor model, now we're up to Fama French five-factor model. Uh, there are lots of other factor models, some of which I think might be talked about today. Uh, we expect a, a, a few factors to be, to be driving the returns on these stocks. And the way to look at the factors or, or the, 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 the dimensionality, the dimension structure 
of this is just to take the cross, the cross product and just form the covariance matrix of these returns, R prime R, normalized. And then we take the eigenvalues. Now, here is a plot of the eigenvalues of all of the returns. And you see that there's one factor that accounts for about 38% of the variation. Obviously, that's the market factor, or something like the market factor. There's 22% for another factor, 11%. <sighs> Maybe there's a fourth factor that accounts for a little bit of it. And then these remaining factors don't, don't account for much. These eigenvalue plots, are, whenever I make them, they almost always come out look, look, looking like this, suggesting three or four factors. Kind of like three and a half factors is what, it, is what it suggests. And there's nothing surprising about this plot. Uh, these factors might be energy, uh, financial disturbances, uh, who, you know, you know, who knows, there are lots of different theories about the factor. And, and so if you look at the ensemble, if you look at the ensemble, you get nothing too surprising. Now, what about the dependent structure, though, at times of market turmoil, when the markets are do, taking these discontinuous moves? What does the dependent structure look like then? That's the question of this paper. And uh, as we saw from the pictures, there are large, rare jumps scattered across the whole time span. So starting, this is just the time interval. This is, this is the first minute, second minute, third minute. At some minute, there was a jump in the market. At some other minute, there may have been a down jump. Some other minute, there may have been down jump, up jump. Scattered across, scattered across there are these uh, jumps. And the way we find the jumps is we use a decision rule that um, measures how big the one minute return is, the one minute move is, relative to the local volatility. So we measure the local volatility and then if the move is too large relative to the local volatility, that interval gets put, labeled a jump, and gets put into the jump bin. And uh, we find uh, 87 intervals out of all of these uh, observations, 867,000 observations. Only 87 of them were, get labeled as jumps. We, we use a very tight, uh, a very strong criteria. We actually use seven local standard deviations. I heard someplace that at CERN, with the particle collider, the rule is five, five sigma in order to get a new particle. I, I never didn't quite know what that meant. But here we use seven sigma. We even use a, 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 a more stringent criterion. And out of all of those, if we look at just the market returns, out of all of them, uh, we only found, we found, found 87 times when the uh, uh, market itself uh, jumped. And the jump is defined as a, se a seven sigma move relative to local volatility in the S&P index future. The future is the, one of the most liquid instruments in the world. The future is the same thing as the index adjusted for interest and dividends, that's all. And it's just the same thing. Uh, and this is a scatter plot of the returns Actually, I had to do some sampling, but you can see how there are these jumps that, that, that kind of stand out, those big returns relative to the local ones. And if I make a plot of just the ones that were labeled as jumps, make a time series plot of them, this is what we get. And there are some interesting things, I think, just from this picture. First, they're scattered kind of randomly across the, across the, the time interval. This is a common finding. Contrary to what a lot of people think, during times of uh, financial crisis and this sort of thing, there are not more jumps. There can be jumps during times of uh, relatively market, uh, relatively quiet periods. Remember, it's measured relative to the local standard. So how volatile is the market right now, and how big is the move? And so you can see that here, when the markets were kind of quiet, there were moves in the future that passed the seven sigma rule, and that's because sigma was so small, and they, 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 they qualify as jump events. Over here in 2008, it took much larger, because the local volatility was so big, it took much larger moves in order to, um, in, in, in order to uh, uh, cross the threshold and be put into the jump in. But a couple of things just to notice that I always find interesting, I make my students do this plot, 
the first thing in their financial econometrics course. And what's interesting is how evenly spread, it's almost like a compound Poisson process, not quite, how evenly spread uh, the, the, uh, the jump uh, intervals are over time, and also how symmetric it is. The market does rally. The stock market does rally. It crashes, but it also rallies. All right? And so again, contrary to a lot of popular misconceptions, uh, the jumps or the seven sigma moves are, are not all crashes. A bunch of them, about as many of them, are rallies as, as crashes. But there they are. OK, so the only th information I'm going to use, the only information I'm going to use from the S&P index future is the marks. What, what were the intervals along this axis that were classified as jump, as jump intervals? That's the only thing I'm going to use the, the index future data for, is to identify, um, uh, to, 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 to identify um, uh, jump times, OK? Now let's do that eigenvalue decomposition. Just with those, now I'm going to take the Dow 30 stocks, but only look at their returns for the intervals that were classified as jumps. And we see a much different structure. We see that there is almost only, kind of almost one factor that accounts for about 77% of the variation, maybe another factor, maybe not, and then, and then so forth. Uh, this is for the Dow, the, uh, the, 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 the Dow 30. And so we're interested, what's interesting to see is, and what this paper does, is develop a statistical test for the statistical significance of the sum of, 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 of these eigenvalues. OK, so collectively, is that, uh, is, that, is that group of eigenvalues, are they statistically significantly different from zero or not? And uh, it, we, developed a, we developed a test in, in general. So suppose someone claims, well, it's actually two. Well, then what is the uh, sum of three, four, five, six, seven, eight? Or I claim it's four, then what is the sum of five, six, seven? Obviously, what's interesting empirically is what is the sum from two, three, four? Is that statistically significantly different from zero or not? And that's what this, that's what this uh, paper is about. And we use uh, statistical tools to develop uh, a test uh, non-standard. You just can't look in a standard textbook and find the theory that you need in order to properly do uh, an asymptotically justifiable uh, test on the, on the statistical significance of, of that collection of eigenvalues. The, the classical formulas from the books uh, don't work. OK, so what the paper does is develop a feasible, asymptotically valid test for the rank of the jump covariance matrix. Rank tests have a longstanding uh, type class of problems in statistics dating back at least to T.W. Anderson, 1951 and earlier. But, but, but none, of the, none of the statistical methods developed in, these, in, this, in this line of work apply here. So we had a, a developed new non-standard uh, asymptotic distribution theory to account for uh, doing the test that we want to do here. And I'm going to apply, in, in the paper, we apply it to three data sets for reasons of time. I'm watching the time. Uh, I'm only going to talk about two here. I'm not going to go through all 42 slides. Don't worry. Um, so that's what the paper does. That's what the paper is about. If we just select the times of turmoil, and take the returns of over those times of turmoil and look at their factor structure, does look at their covariance matrix, how much of a how much of a how much of a reduction in the rank of that covariance matrix is there in the data? Um, and that's what that's what that's what the paper is about. All right. A little bit of model. All right. So the underlying model, the very standard model in finance, we have two processes. This x is the 30 by 1 vector on the Dow, and z is the uh, 
market, these are log prices. This is the log market index. These are the log prices. This is a standard uh, stochastic volatility model driven by Brownian motion. And then uh, we have, we're going to assume finitely active jump process. Uh, so there's going to be a, a random sum of jumps in X and some jumps in Z. And the theory is that at, the, and Z here is unobserved. Z is actually, it's not the market, it's, it's unobserved. Um, the theory is that at the jump times of jump times tau of z, there is there an exact relationship between um, the return on those 30 and, and that one return. Um, z could be a vector, and, and there are ways to test for jumps in, 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 in a vector. But here we're only going to use a scalar uh, measure, uh, just the market itself. So the um, uh, denote the ve uh, vector by, this is just the first difference operator. There are three deltas floating around in high frequency finance. They're all, I think they're all here. One is that delta up there for the increment in a continuous time process. This delta here for the, for the first difference of the process. And then that delta there for the, for the sampling interval. And you just have to pick it up from the context. Uh, you get used to it. All right. So uh, intuitively, uh, a jump is a, is, a, is a big move, as I said. That's too, too large. Uh, and if z jumps uh, at a particular time, then the return I observe is uh, this, this linear relationship plus a stochastic error. And if z doesn't jump, uh, then the return is just, uh, uh, is just the, the, the idiosyncratic part of x plus any idiosyncratic jumps in, in X itself. I'm not interested in the idiosyncratic jumps. Some of these stocks are pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies jump because information comes out. You know, a new drug uh, is really good and the thing goes way up, or uh, uh, the FDA is not going to approve it, and then, and then the, jo the, the stock tanks. All, none of those jumps play any role in this analysis. We're only looking at the aggregate uh, jumps in the aggregate index. And so that's the model. Uh, how do we find the method? How do we find the jumps? I just told you we use a cutoff method that uh, actually dates back to work by Cecilia Mancini. Uh, effectively, we use a cutoff that's set to be um, so many local standard deviations of local volatility. Here we use seven. Uh, you got to adjust for the for the U-shaped pattern and the overall level of volatility to do it sensibly. But anyways, uh, there's a proposition. It can be shown that with probability approaching one, uh, you capture all the all the all these jumps in the set. And actually, you do it so fast that it has no first order effect on the asymptotic distribution of the statistics that you're interested in. That's a very convenient thing. You don't have to worry about the the uh, uh, randomness of the measurement error, at least to the first order, uh, in in the in the jumps. Okay, let's look at the anatomy of a jump. If we look at the anatomy of a jump, you can get a basic idea as to as to what, how the statistical theory works for this paper. So let's just this is just a simulation. So we got a continuous process chugging along like this diffusively, and then at some time, at some particular time, I think this was 1.6, it took a jump. The green is the height of the jump, and then the blue is the stochastic evolution of the asset uh, price after the jump. Now, in the data set, I don't observe the green distance. Rather, I observe this distance between the red, because I only sample at the integers. So you can see that what I observe, red, the difference in the red, is the jump plus some random error. And as that sampling interval goes to zero, that random error is going to kind of get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and uh, the number of jumps is fixed. Once we detected them or once they're there, the, there are just so many finite number of jumps in the, uh, uh, in the sample period. The trick that makes it all work is that the um, error in this relationship here connecting the returns to whatever the index we're thinking about is, uh, is, is asymptotically small with a, known, with a known distribution. 
It's on the order of the sampling interval to the square root of n is, is, is the error. And, it, and, and it's got a known distribution. Uh, the distribution, uh, if uh, you want to write it down, it's mixed, mixed, normal. It's a mixed normal. Uh, I'm getting low on time. The reason is it's mixed. There are two normals, and they're mixed by a uniform. And the reason for the uniform is that is that I don't. We don't know when that jump occurred inside the interval. Okay, the volatility changes across the jump. In fact, in my picture, so you couldn't really see it. There was a higher volatil low, diffusive volatility post jump than pre jump, and that and that has to be accounted for in the statistical tests. All right. So uh, that error, if you want to realize it, you could think of it as uh, uh, this times a Gaussian, that times a Gaussian, mixed up by a uniform. Uh, random variable. It's got a non-standard distribution. It's not a pivotal distribution. It depends upon unknown parameters, but we can estimate the parameters and, and get, get, make reliable uh, inference. OK. How do we actually do it in practice? The jump locations are uh, obtained exactly as I said, I1 through IPN. PN is the number of jumps that we found. We assemble as, as, as one of those matrices with Time, time across the top, stocks index along the bottom. J hat is the matrix of jump returns. Um, and the test statistic is on the rank of Jn, which is the same as the rank of J transpose J or JJ transpose. And then the test statistic is the sum of, if I claim it's R, then it's uh, the sum of the eigenvalues. These, this, these are the square singular values uh, from, from r plus 1 on all the way up to d. So the test is on the statistical significance of that quantity uh, computed from the data. And it has a, a known asymptotic distribution. We worked it out. These u's have to do, the u and the v are pieces of a singular value decomposition that I don't have the time to get into. But anyways, we know how to simulate from this distribution. And therefore, by simulation, we can determine uh, the, the asymptotic distribution of the statistic of interest. And therefore, we can determine the cutoff points. So we just use Monte Carlo as a trick for getting the asymptotic distribution because of, the, of, of, its, of its complexity. That, 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 that arises in statistics. When you, when, you, when, you get a, when you get an asymptotic approximation that depends in kind of an unusual way on some unknown parameters, uh, you have to use simulations in order to just get the asymptotic distribution itself to get the threshold, the cutoff threshold. And uh, OK, we're going to skip all this stuff. Um, and uh, it works. So, uh, the, theory, the paper uh, proves that this statistical procedure of collecting these jump, this matrix of jump returns, uh, looking at its eigenvalues, adding up the ones that you think should be statistically insignificant, getting your critical values from that distribution, that non-standard distribution. Theorem 1 says that it works. Theorem 2 says that actually you could bootstrap the whole procedure. So you got to actually, on top of it, you got to prove that the bootstrap of the simulation works. But you can, and we did. And um, uh, there's some, I don't have time to explain why the bootstrap is so, is so uh, convenient in this particular context. And uh, as is now uh, demanded by referees, uh, the procedure is validated by many Monte Carlo. So we Monte Carlo, the, you have to believe me, we Monte Carlo the thing to death. OK? And under the null hypothesis, does it have the right size that you think it should have? Under plausible alternatives, will it detect plausible alternatives that are far away from, that are not, you know, that are with reasonably distance from, from the null hypothesis? And, and, and yes. And, uh, and, and I have to refer you to the paper for all those details. The fun part, the interesting part, is how it is, is the application. And I'm going to describe that in the, we end at 2.30, right, Ying Ying? OK, I'm going to describe that in the last uh, five to six minutes. I'm going to apply the theory. Uh, there are three groups of assets. I don't have time to talk about group one. 
I'm only going to talk about group two and group three. Group two is the 30 Dow stocks, okay, 2007, 2015. And then also, it's going to be some returns on, on bonds and, and, and FX. Okay, data set, I don't think I really need to explain all this. We got a long data set, covers a very interesting um, uh, period. All, all hell is breaking loose in various times of this data set. Um, so it's, it's an interesting, okay? The procedure is you detect the jumps at the futures at the one minute level. That's very clean. That's very, very clean because the future is so liquid. But the individual stocks that I showed you in that plot early on, they can take a gradual jump in response. And so what needs to be done to account for that is you've got to aggregate the returns starting from the jump interval five minutes forward or ten minutes forward. Actually, five minutes is enough to, 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 to get all of, the, all, of the, um, all of the gradual jump. The gradual jump is a type of microstructure noise, and uh, the way we account for it is with uh, this, this aggregation procedure. We do it for five, which really gets it all, but we also do it for 10. All that happens with 10 is that, is that you, lo you lose some power. All right, and here's how it comes out. Okay, first off, if you do it over the whole sample, uh, you strongly reject the null hypothesis of one factor. What that meant is that uh, either it wasn't a one-factor model or that the coefficient, the factor uh, loading coefficient, changed over time. So what we did is we broke the sample up into sub-periods, years, 2007, 2015. We ran the test um, uh, year by year. So uh, for the null hypothesis that the rank is 1, um, these are the p-values uh, as, as percents. So 1 is like 1%, 5 is 5%. And if the number is uh, smaller than 1, that means you would reject the null. And what's interesting is that in only uh, three of the, of the uh, however many cases there are here, only three instances uh, do we reject. And you're supposed to be impressed by the, by the few number of red arrows here. Okay. Remember, this is a very small sample once we only look at these jump events. And so the statistics don't, don't speak uh, loudly with one voice. So it looks like uh, maybe the evidence points to a one-factor model for jumps in equities. And we treated that factor as latent. We only used the, the S&P to identify the times. And so if you take the cross-sectional sums of squares, you can kind of extract the factor. And uh, if you extract the factor, if you take the standard deviation of the market jump, of the market uh, jump, and the standard, you standardize, standardize that means zero and, and variance one, you see that the extracted factor uh, uh, is, is essentially the same thing as the S&P uh, index. This is for a, a different set of portfolios that I don't have time uh, to get into. OK? So the evidence pointed to a one, probably a one-factor structure for equities at the jump times. What about the other asset classes, bonds and, and foreign currencies? There, you get a whole string of arrows. You're supposed to be impressed by the large number of arrows here red arrows. What that means is just about every year we reject the null hypothesis of a one-factor structure. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, that same model doesn't work. That covariance matrix doesn't uh, collapse. These are uh, uh, currencies and bonds are just different than equities uh, in times of uh, extreme moves. And it's far more challenging, it's not surprising, for the market jump to span linear manner returns on bonds and currencies during market events. OK. And so uh, okay. So the, re the empirical results are this. For one group of assets, there's a lot of evidence suggesting a one-factor model. That's, think about how strong that is. 
You got 30 variables, and the entire 30 by 30 covariance matrix collapses to a rank one matrix. That's an incredibly strong null hypothesis. And generally, we did not reject that null hypothesis, which is pretty interesting empirically. It makes you think about the finance and, and why. But when you look at the other asset classes, um, uh, their, their, their covariance matrix does not collapse in that manner. It just, they're, they're, they're just, they just act differently uh, at the times of stress and turmoil. Uh, what else can you do? Whatever you want. Uh, here are some challenges for people. Uh, you can look at uh, various economic news events. You can slice and dice the jumps if you want to. You could use something else to detect, uh, uh, to detect uh, big moves. And all that stuff we're going to leave for uh, future work and maybe for anyone who's interested in doing all the, all the codes online, the, the computations on the data are quick, easy, simple, and effective. And, and, and effective. The theory, though, which I skipped over, um, it takes some work to do it. And so my last slide, if we can get to it, well, it just summarizes the main message. We developed the, 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 the theory. It's non-standard. The empirical evidence suggests that equities collapse to a one-dimensional structure at times of market turmoil. That means there's no diversification. That means that at times of turmoil, there's no diversification. That's a common complaint among, in, among practitioners. I lose all my diversification. Well, yes, you do. Uh, and, but that's not true about the other asset classes. Uh, so they would actually provide some diversification if you wanted to speculate in bonds and, and currencies as well. And that's it. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you, Professor Tao Chen. It's a very nice talk. And uh, my question is, uh, in the empirical study, and uh, you uh, use a yearly uh, observation of less than 10, like 10 jumps or less yeah. than 10 jumps, is yeah. that uh, really... Uh, what I concern is that's enough observation to claim any. Yeah, so are we. So are we. As we, we. There's no doubt we lose power by 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 dividing the data set year by year, where there's only a few jumps per year. Yeah, there is some loss of power. Mm -hmm. There is, but there were still some years in there with a lot of jumps where we did not reject the null hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it's a, it's it's a topic of concern for us. Mm -hmm. I can't make more jumps than there really were. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, we, we might use a lower threshold and get more jumps that way. Seven was really, really a strong threshold. Okay. Professor Tuchin again. Sorry, really.